first time I met Avram yes. Fried. Uh, it was a Moti Zisser concert. It was Moti Zisser. He used to be a big benefactor of Jewish music. Okay. Alava Shalom. Um, and he, I used to tour with Daddy a lot. So, so Daddy brought us, uh, brought me to this, uh, to, to his house, and we were doing this party. And and Moti Zisser just made his his money, and he was making a big party for his friends. So he had this. He bought this big silver menorah. It was the biggest silver menorah that Sorfim could make. Wow. It would look like the menorah of the Bet Hamikdash, but it was like yeah. it was that the re real deal. But it was so big that and then the uh, Avram Fried sang with, with the brachot and the whole thing, and then he was supposed to light it. So they asked me to pick him up to light the, the, the reach to, to reach the top. That's how I met Avram Fried wow. to pick him up that's to reach. The, the, that's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Danny, I want to start from the beginning. Can can you um, can you tell us who you are, where you're from, from as far back as you can remember? Who's Danny Flam? Who's Danny Flam? Um, so I'm 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 Danny Flam. I'm a musician. Obviously, we're interviewing musicians. I specialize in brass. I've been playing uh, brass for many many years. Sure. And um, I've been probably in the center of like all, like specifically Jewish music for the last, uh, you know, 35 years. But um, but also in general, I just do a lot of music. I do a lot of production. I do a lot of music. And I'm from originally from Israel. Where in Israel? Rehovot. My, my father still lives in Rehovot. Oh. My family, my brother. So yeah, um, we have a lot of family. And... Um, I played for the Israel Philharmonic. I played for the uh, Israeli uh, Air Force Orchestra. Pretty casual about that. That's that's really cool. Yeah. So I've done stuff. You know, I've uh, I've been around. I played with everybody. Toured with everybody. As a as a kid in Rehovot, what kind of music were you exposed to when you got? So, actually, for my bar mitzvah, I got an Ab Abba album. No way. Yeah, it was one of the best ones. That and a Bonnie M, I think, was an album. And I got some classical music albums, specifically like brass trumpet and trombone. Any Israeli or like Jewish music or not really? No. I, um, when I was in fourth grade, if I go back, when I was in fourth grade, I, I, I learned in Kibbutzat Yavne, Kibbutz Yavne. No way, I went to music school right now. Oh, wow. Give that Washington. Right, right, got, right, yeah. right across there's like a, a, a elementary school. Okay. So I went to that elementary school, and um, and they brought down this group from from turns out from the Israel Philharmonic to play a brass quintet. So it's two trumpets, a trombone, French horn, and tuba. Um, for people that don't know that that that's a tuba, okay. and there was a trombone player, and he played this really cool stuff, and it sounded cool, wonky, and I liked the instrument, and I was like, I want to play that trumpet that does that. So I started off on recorder. So I'm actually playing recorder. I actually record a lot of recorder music. Yeah, I do a lot of a lot of flutes. I just did one for Moshe Lau for Wait, flutes or recorder? No, no, recorder. Okay. I do the, those. I mean, it's a type of flute. So. Okay. So I just did, you know, I did some stuff. Uh, so that was my main instrument from first grade to fourth grade. At fourth grade, um, I decided I want to play trombone. And then we moved to Rehovot. And then I joined the local, my father brought me in to, to join the local orchestra, the local um, like youth orchestra. And they tried to convince me to play everything. I was like, no, I want to play trombone. I was this little kid and the trombone was taller than me. I was going to say it's a big instrument. Right. So they made me come back a year later when my hand was long enough. And, and the way you know if it's trombone, if I could reach the end of the trombone, you can play it. then you can play it. So I was like, every day, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I got, stretch your arms. I stretched my arms and they're like, here, I can play it. They're like, okay, okay. You're, play. you're in. You're in. So that's, that's how I started my trombone. So I've, I've, I didn't do any, it wasn't like Jewish music oriented. It was just music oriented. Sure. So I played with the Israel Philharmonic. Uh, eventually I, I, I got really good. I used to practice a lot. Um, it's definitely practicing is a lot and it can't, comes from inside. Sure. Like you can't really force kids. I mean, you could force kids, but really... They have to want it. You have to want it. So I really practiced a lot until the point where I got insanely good. What and age was this? 
This is when you still... No, this was like towards age 15, 16 okay. already. And then I played with Israel Falmanic. I played a solo with Zubin Mehta. I did some stuff. And, uh, and then I got accepted into the Army Orchestra. So that I was doing that for a couple of years. And then in the middle of the Army, the, 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 there's, there's two bands. There's the Air Force Orchestra. There's the Army Band. And there's uh, there's all these different little bands, like little choirs. Is the Air Force Orchestra like more elite? It used to be. Yeah, it was. I think they, they, they closed it down. But it was this big band, elitistic, amazing big band. We had the, the guy that discovered Lady Gaga was our bass player, Tal Herzberg. Like he, Allah va shalom, he died. But it's like an insane, like the, the level of musicianship is insane. It's like world class musicians, Grammy winners. Uh, yeah, um, the level was really, really high. But during that period, our, our our commander, his name was Danny Mosco. He was a trumpet player, and he introduced me to the other band director, was the guy named Mona Rosenblum. So Mona Rosenblum was a, was a commander in the other orchestra. And this was before MBD, the tour in Russia. This was before everything. And my first ever recording session in a, in a professional setting was when I was about 18, was with Mona. In while you were in the army? While I was in the army, he brought me in to do something for the Makat Rabbanut. And I think that song is still being played. You know, I think that was one of those one of the tracks, but but we did that recording. We did a recording for like Yom Ma'ut on TV or something. And I that was that was like the first time you recorded professionally. Then. First time I recorded professionally was with him. How was working? Do you remember what it was like to work with him back then? Yes, I could tell you everything. Oh, yeah. I, I remember that session because it, it was it was a lesson for life. So I took it with me. Okay. What happened was is we sat we sat in the studio and we started playing, and he says. Um, Let's, play, let's warm up. So we start warming up and we're playing some like jazz stuff or some, some kind of song and I'm playing and he goes, um, okay, that was, uh, that was very nice. Now we need to play Jewish music. These people need to play Jewish music. It needs to sound because that's what they're used to. Who are these people? The people that are, the, the consumers of this music okay. need to. You have oh, to so it wasn't something for the army. It was one of his. No, no, it was for the army. But oh, the people okay. that are playing is Jewish music. It needs to sound like Jewish music. And I was like, because we played some like chord or something, and he was like, no, no. He said something like that. And then I was like, okay. When we record, it needs to sound like Jewish music. And then I learned the lesson is like, when you record, it needs to sound like what the client wants it. And what's the other person on the other side perceiving the music? It's not about what your musicality. A lot of musicians tend to, like, when they enter the studio, they do this musical thing whatever it is but it's not what the client wants yes, that's the art it's thing. very nice it's my art and you're know, like and then oh they took away my art it's not it's and if you're there to be a session musician you're there to, to serve exactly so that was the life lesson from that first session you've clearly mastered it because you're probably one of the busiest <laughs> of recording musicians that i know which i'll talk about later okay so you met mona so that was mona but that was like a one-time thing and i haven't met him again for many years like four or five years later so that was like my only encounter with Mona. That was the very interesting encounter. For the most part, I was just doing non-Jewish music. I did Israeli TV. I did um, I did the Israeli chamber orchestra. I was playing more classical music. I was playing more commercial music. Um, I'm not a jazz musician. People always confuse jazz with commercial music. Okay. And it's not the same thing. Want to explain a little bit the difference that people listen um, Just a little bit. Yeah, I guess. I mean, a jazz musician is like mainly, you know... Um, it's improvised. It's like there's a tune. There's the basic tune, which you kind of play through once. And then over the chords or the changes that that song um, is written to, the musicians will improvise, basically. Um, but in, in a larger sense, it's a lot more, you know, I don't want to call jazz in general. There's so many definitions here, like musicians for musicians. Um, you know, but commercial music is musicians writing stuff that the general public can consume easily and enjoy and listen to a hundred times whereas when people are playing jazz they're it's more about self-expression and them doing their thing for a kind of a niche crowd right so how do i do is that i i you know what it may be maybe it's like so so in jazz you bring the audience into your world okay. and in commercial music you're bringing yourself into the audience's okay, world yeah I, I hear that okay so continue um with your story so we're back so 
you f five years later you saw Mona again, right? What what was after the army? after the army? Yeah, I started playing in orchestras. I started I started working. I started recording more in Israel. In Israel, I started working. I went to a family a family wedding that. There was a trumpet player named Duby Eckstein, which sure. I still play, I play yes. with. He's still in the scene, right? He's coming on Thursday. I'm playing with Benny Friedman. He's coming in from Israel to, fly, to, to play. But he was on a gig, and he was like, hey, I told him I play trombone. He goes, oh, come sit in with us. And I was like, oh, I'll sit in with you. And then that's how I started my whole Jewish music endeavor. Wow. That was my... Uh, was what, was, what was the gig you sat in with him? Just a family wedding. Like a wedding. It was the Ev Vindish was the name of the band. Yeah, so I, then I started playing with the Israel Philharmonic. I played for the Israel Philharmonic for 18 years. I was playing, uh, you know, all famous conductors, anybody, you know, Zubin Mehta, Yo-Yo Ma. Na name drop, name drop, name drop. A lot of big... <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and then uh, I'm my ADD. is like uh, it's kicking it. perfect. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> so... A uh, lot of lot of music. I did a lot of recording sessions. Then then I got in recording with Mona. Uh, so he used to work with a guy named Moshe Kaufman, Alava Shalom, mm -hmm. which died I think last year. But he, all his recording sessions were with with the, with with, uh, with Zach Kaufman. And then he switched over. I started recording. So my first album with Mona, I think, was the the, the one after. Da, 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 da. So the one after that, yeah, I was on a gig. I was on a gig recently, and we were playing something. And some guy goes, "Let's play an oldie," and I'm like, "What do you mean oldie? I played on the session." He goes, "When was it?" I was like, "35 years ago." <laughs> I think music keeps people young. Because there's something about your energy that anyone who's in the music industry or anyone who's seen you at an event, like it's kind of one as as well as being a brilliant musician, is that you always bring like a fun, young energy. Like, where? Uh, how do you do that? Where does that come? I just like what I do. There's a reason I picked it. I was actually working also on computers at the same time. So I'm also I'm like a computer programmer, senior, whatever. And then I just I decided to not do that because I just want to do music because this is what I love doing. There's I'm, no repetition of like wedding gigs and stuff. No. no. There's another somebody pays me to blow a pipe. <laughs> It's like, right? You have to bring a party. You have to be fun. No, First of all, what's what's the point? What I'm going to go out of the house and be depressed? It doesn't matter how many of these you've done. Like these two people are go hopefully only going to get married once, and like this is their special night. And if you're standing on the stage looking like you want to be anywhere else, it's. I really still. I'm still sentimental. Sometimes I cry at chupas. I love that. That's it awesome. Like a serious, like, if so they're really in love, it's like you see this couple that's really in love. You know, how can right. you not empathize? You know, it's like, I, I, and and if sometimes, sometimes not. Should, but, honestly, that should be like a qualification for being allowed to be playing at weddings. Like at least once a year, you have to cry a chupa. No, sometimes it's a beautiful chupa. Hundred like, percent. Like yeah, you know, like a story. You know, they've been together since. Nah, 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 now the fun. You know, it's like how can you not? You know, I think especially. Uh, maybe this is an American thing, but like, you know, now chuppas have kind of become this thing where, you know, there's as many musicians as possible, all kind of like reading off iPads and it's all just a bit robotic and sterile. And I get it. Like there's, it, it's not to say it's not musically beautiful, but there's like this, like emotion that I feel is missing from a lot of it. One of the most beautiful ideas that I saw is in Europe. I played this gig in Europe. There was a $20 million wedding. They flew us in, but the chuppa was for family only. Oh. They had a full orchestra, full everything, the same production. They weren't showing off to anyone. They weren't showing off to anybody. It was just for them. Wow. It was just the parents and close relatives. It was maybe 20 people at the whole chuppah. That's crazy. Right. They wanted it. Really, they had a minion of guys, and, and that was it. But, but the, the party was huge, but the chuppah is private. They don't want people with cell phones and selfies. and. So um, coming to America... So I played in the orchestra, and then at some point, I have this um, thing I tell people that you need to do a five-year plan and try to try to try to build your life. So, so my philosophy is is that you can't just roll with life. You have to have a direction. You have to think about where am I going to be in five years. Every day of your life, you wake up in the morning and what's my five-year plan? Mm -hmm. And 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 do something that day that'll get you closer. Just just keep in the direction. As long as you have a direction, you're gonna reach everything you ever wanted. Wow. And and, and it worked. And the problem was I was 28, 
I got to age 28 and I got to everything I ever wanted. I was playing in this orchestra, the, one of the world's top 20 orchestras in the world, one of the best trombone players in the world. And I'm, I'm and like, and this is it. I'm going to do this right. till I retire. Till I'm just like, well, what am I doing here next 40 years? I was age 35. There was like, like, you know, life was like stagnant. Um, nothing is, you know, I have kids and whatever. And my wife wanted to move to America. And I was like trying to make a decision. Do I want to move to America? I don't want to move to America. And... I don't know why I went to, I, at that that week. That week we have a big shul. Not don't you don't get a lot of aliyot, right? And there was an aliyah in, in Parashat uh, Nitzavim or Vayelech. No Nitzavim, I think Nitzavim, where it says, "Yosef uh, Chaim v'Tatov v'Tamavet Ara u'Vacharta b'Chaim." And I was like, "Okay, we're moving to America." Wow. And that's how I made the decision. It was basically an aliyah in the Torah. I was like, "Okay." Oh. is a good message and okay did you have a game plan when you when you moved or no it was i came here i got a lot of promises i got promises from this guy and that guy and the wedding orchestras and you're going to do recording and everybody said no don't worry you'll have a lot of work and i came here and there was nothing because people will promise you always yeah sure come we'll give you work nobody gave me work and it was pretty miserable and dire so I started working computers for a while. And then and then I was working computers and doing some stuff. And I started building myself out. So I managed to get myself started getting myself recording sessions, starting to get I was I was up up against like the local guys didn't want me, right? Obviously they didn't want the competition. So it took a lot of working. I worked with uh, I created a very very tight team with uh, Tony Garuso was a trumpet player and Mike McGovern Alava Shalom was a trumpet player and Ron Bertolette oh, which till today I, he's coming in today for a session right. I met him here when he did the session yeah. right so he's coming in he's going he's to record on your song Amazing. today um, so Ron I created like a tight team that actually worked so you were like a section that worked yeah Kenny Rampton um, who else was there now I have Kai Sandoval as one of my oh, main yeah. guys um it's it's uh I've created a pretty tight group of people that I really enjoy. There's there's a whole pack of other people, um, some, some other people. I'm I'm just worried that I'm gonna offend somebody <laughs> that I didn't mention their name, but the guys that I I, I work with on a, on a regular basis, and and in friendship. So um, we created this very um, we created we created this very unique sound. I, I've managed to create what, what what I brought to the table was this idea is that this kind of Israeli chutzpah that where you sit in the studio, like a lot of things that people don't realize, the studio sessions with Mona, at least in the first 20 years, now he writes everything. But the first 20 years, we used to come to the studio and um, and he would go, okay, I'm going to go Davin Mincha, fill in the song. There's no arrangement. Well, there's an arrangement for the intro, there's an arrangement for the uh, middle, okay, and, and there was a couple of lines that he was thinking of, but then he was like, who has a good idea? Danny, do you have... So a lot of the ideas that are Mona are, 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 are let's say, mine, or they're Avram Felder's. Wow. Avram Felder was a huge player in the, in the recording it's funny, scene. Uh, like, it's kind of cool that he... He wanted your input and he wanted your musicality. I guess a lot of rangers show up and they're like, hey, We what? played a wedding and I came up with this idea I stole from Phil Collins. Da, 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 into the oh. studio. And then he comes up and he calls me up the next day and he goes, Danny, um, what was that line? Da, da, da. <laughs> and then, then then he calls me and, okay, Wednesday we have a recording session. So I come to the recording session and he has this line. Da, 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 da. Which is in Tim Chet Zecher Amalek. Yeah, he stole so that. Basically, in a, in a very, very roundabout way, Phil Collins got integrated into Tim <laughs> Chet Zecher Amalek. So this is that's the story oh, wow. behind. Now, I mean, like I have a lot of stories. I mean, it's like I want to hear all of them. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have all day, but um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's 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 the whole that's the, that's the recording scene in Israel. Like Ruvi Banet, he went to Davin Mincha for the one of the leap of I think it was the first Lipa album or the second Lipa album. So there's a bit, uh, da, so so we come in and and we're playing and there's the music and we're going. Uh, uh, it was Doran Silashi, Arik Davidov, myself, and Micha Davis was playing okay. trombone, and we played. Uh, uh, um, and 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 the tune was da, 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 da. and 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 Doran was just playing with the salsa orchestra, okay. so we played it like Latin. <laughs> <laughs> we finished playing the se the session, 
and 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 Ruvi comes back from Mincha, he hits play, and he goes, "Oh no, that's not the style I wanted. I wanted it completely different." But we don't have any time. Uh, we have to go. And now it's like one of those things they play. Everybody plays this Latin thing at weddings uh, because we made we just we did whatever we want. So that's like the kind of scene, we, so, recording scene, like like lines and things like that. Yeah. Oh, you know, it'd be a great idea <laughs> yeah. to put here. <laughs> yeah. That thing Danny played. Yeah, because it's funny for me when I well, I think when many people think Mona, like horns, brass, like is definitely like one of the you know those huge intros and those huge parts. So you're basically saying like. I mean, as as well as the fact that you like played on m most of that stuff, right? Like from, like a lot of it was actually your ideas, which is crazy. Yeah, but the other thing of Mona is what's unique about Mona is that he sits <clears throat> in the session with the musicians in the room, and is part of the music. And if it doesn't get happy, he starts gets up and he dances and he gets right, the people. Gets the vibe. He gets but... the vibe. It's like very important for him to be in the room with the musicians, conducting. It gives a different vibe to the music. Another thing he does is he writes in keys that are uncomfortable for musicians so and and deliberately and, what deliberately or deliberately and also he does specifically writing in sharp keys and never in flat keys okay never write in a flat key right always in a sharp key it always sounds brighter Interesting. dark keys will always sound dark and and the other thing is um it, it, it also right on the edge of the technical playability if you do that then there's a vibe that comes through. You hear the people struggling. Like the imperfection. It's not the imperfection. Even if they're playing it perfectly, you can hear the struggle. It, right. Oh, it's so interesting. You write one or two things, not the whole session, yeah. but you write a couple of things. You that, can hear people like reaching for something. Yeah, you hear yeah. people working wow. hard. If it's easy, it sounds easy. It's so interesting. Yeah, you don't want it to sound easy. You want it to sound mm, energy. Like, like you're giving put effort. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so age 35, back. Okay. So that's how I... So that's how the session, you know, like we have to roll back. <laughs> this great. So this is all this the story behind like the recording in Israel. So it's a lot of improvisation, learning how to play in the studio, how to get through a microphone. All these different things that of going and standing in front of, uh, like during the session when you um, make a take, it sounds perfect. Everybody goes into the thing. You listen one more time. Let's listen to this. We're taking a break and we're listening to the song. You hit a break and he goes, okay, let's do one more take. And that's always the take because yeah. everybody heard, everybody like, oh, okay. Right. And you come in. Also, and I feel like once you, once everyone knows that there is a take that's passable, then the pressure's kind of removed and it's like everyone just plays freely without overthinking, you know. Right. Like, I always thought it was my, it was, it was our thing. And then one day I actually <clears throat> uh, heard that John Lennon used to do that oh, all really? the time. And yeah, a lot of it's, it's a, it's a common, it's apparently it's a common. Yeah, like stay all day in the studio and then the last, let's just do one more. That's the one. Or a lot of the time it's the, Hey, let's just check levels, you know, and, and then right. Like, wait, what? Like, okay. We're done. Um, I'm trying to remember who there's a story with David Foster, you know, the, the Canadian producer, um, Mm -hmm. oh, I can't remember who it was. Uh, one of these like super famous pop singers, and she basically came into a session, and um, you know he was like checking the levels, and she finished the take, and she said, "All right, thanks, bye." And she and he was like, "What?" He, she was like, "No, I only do this once," <laughs> and left. And that was the take. I have to find out what it was, and I'll send it to you. Okay, so you're 35. So I'm 35. <laughs> I come to New York. I start start building up a recording thing, and uh, no, I'm I'm I'm. It's starting to work out. It's starting to build up and then um i decided to quit like the, the 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 performing and i was more into computers and then one day i was like okay i can't do this anymore i'm gonna go back to music and i'm gonna really do it well i had a I had an employee that discovered how to actually how to use the internet to leverage to get people to know who you are okay so i was like okay let me do the same thing and i started like pushing my product and what i am and who i am and one day I get a call, it was 2006 or seven, I get a call um, from a producer named Ken Lewis. Ken Lewis has uh, about 100 platinum, at this point, 100 platinum albums and, uh, and millions of Grammys and whatever. Mm -hmm. But he calls me up, he goes, I have this project I need you to play on. Um, I need it now, I need it tomorrow. Can you cancel everything, <clears throat> it'll be worth <throat> your time. I like a wedding or whatever. It's like, oh, sure. I just canceled everything. And I need this. I need this. I went, I, I bought a tuba. I bought for the session. Wow. 
yeah, I, I, I mustered every single brass instrument I had. I have this picture with my car full of instruments, full of like maybe, full of like brass to the rim. It's like just, just stuffed with brass. And I just drove over. And I was like, what's the project? He goes, it's for Kanye West. It's a song. We think it's going to be a number one song. Wow. I'm like, okay. So we just recorded the song a whole day. Then I, this was high note that I couldn't reach. So I called up my friend Tony and I brought him in to, to, to record the high note. Huh. Turns out that they recorded three different horn sections already or two different horn sections before and they couldn't stand the way it sounded and they wanted yeah. a new version that'll so sound in, good. In your version, you played all the horns. It wasn't. I played all the horns, yeah. And, it, and uh, also I came up with this line that's actually inside the... Uh, of course, I, I always come up with my own lines. That's huge. But when was this? What year, do you remember? It was 2007. I think the song came out in 2008. So anyway, so it turns out it was All of the Lights. And it's not only a song, it was voted by Billboard magazine as the song of the decade. Wow. And it's like a nine-time platinum song. So after that, I did stuff for, for, for Jay-Z, and I did stuff for uh, like uh, Rick Ross, and even recently... Uh, I've done stuff for John Legend and like wow. for this song, a lot of do you, do stuff. Do you interact with any of the... No. The, uh, no. It's always like through producers, through... My teacher told me, never talk to the conductor, you'll always get in trouble. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, you just keep your own <clears throat> corner. I like that. Um, okay, I want to I wanna stop for a second. Uh, not stop, I want to ask you something. Um, that I was maybe going to ask later, but things we're talking about it now. Do you think that it's possible to separate between a person and their art? And the reason I'm asking is someone like Kanye West, who obviously recently has come out with all the things that he said, um, and and he's not the he's not the first music you know people he's not the first musician to be anti-Semitic has happened many times in the past. I don't know if he's anti-Semitic. Oh, if he is. I okay. don't think he's anti-Semitic. I think he really thinks that he's, people want to be something, something bigger. I mean, like, you know, the Rambam says when somebody wants to become Jewish, yeah. right? And you say, you want to become Jewish? Are you sure? Look how terrible our situation is. Horrible. Look, everybody hates us. Right. Yeah. And then look, and no one wants to be, why would you want to be Jewish? And why didn't you write, right? So he said, I want to be Jewish. Okay, I'm like, okay, I understand. You, see, that. you think he wants to be Jewish? That's what it is. Of course. I mean, he said it, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, everybody's like, no, he's not this. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't. No, it doesn't. I don't know, feel it that way. No, no, but, 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 but should I? Should I? Say? No, because the reason I think it's funny. It's like okay, he's the uh, people ask the same question about um, you know, How, Roger Waters, right? Oh, it's like, Roger Waters is anti-Semitic. Uh, okay, so let's take him for he example, hates? like to listen to his music is are those two separate things like is the person who makes the music i'll tell you something i've been thinking about for, a, for lately because i've had interactions now with musicians that that i told them like the people that are like hating israel or hating on jews and i'm like so why aren't you not following me why did why are you unfollowing or blocking me or whatever and i'm like cuz i don't hate you yeah. i don't hate you you hate me i'm not going to unblock and then the other thing is that we've been around for 3,500 years. In the year 701 BC, we know the exact date, Lachish was taken over by Sancheriv, the year 701 BC. Mm -hmm. It's 2,900 years ago. Mm -hmm. 2,900 years ago. And he has a relief in his, uh, they found in the dig, like how he destroyed Yuda. Yuda is no more. And there's a this thing of pictures of Yudim going to exile. And we're still here. Right. We're here, and those guys don't exist anymore. So I'm saying, you can basically hate them. Yeah. Yeah. It's whatever. No, it's, okay, cool. No, it's a so I'm saying, perspective. I like that. And, and the music? I like the music. Everyone does. I mean, like, there's, you it's know. Like, I don't really, I, 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 I don't hear words. I only hear music. That's a problem. I'm me. a little bit like that as well. If Which is a, a problem, because sometimes the words are like horrible words, and they're like, yeah, I if, if I hear a good groove, I I you kind of got me. That's it. I'm, right. You can sing about anything. That's like whatever. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so back to where, where where are we in your story? So, oh, so you ended up recording with a bunch of big artists. Any particularly like? I mean, that's obviously an amazing story. But any other kind of stories like that that stand out to you recording for mainstream artists? <sighs> I 
I had this um, this interaction. Like I did this thing for Elton John recently. Um, casual. That was the way the way you kind of nearly forgot about that was very casual. No, because it was a casual tune. It's not like one of his main songs. It's like a side <laughs> song that he did on an album. None of his songs are side songs, but carry on. Okay, so he did this, this project, and and his producer, I was asking him, why did you come to me? They said, because they decided that I have an iconic sound wow. because of what I did for all of the lights. So I guess that my sound is, it's I have a sound. So I have a very specific sound. I have a specific way I play. It's different than everybody's. When I play on gigs and, I, and I'm, I'm the leader, I make them play my way. I bring in people, but I... What does that mean? Like, if you can describe to a non-musician, what, what does your way mean? I play a different, like, like, let's say, let me give an example. Somebody has a track and it says, it says on the mu- in the sheet music, let's say it says to play, da, 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 uh, 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 right? So I'll come at it from the point of view immediately, or no, you know what? A better example. What does that mean? Let's say somebody gives me five notes and they'll say, da, 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 da. Right, so most musicians will approach it and they'll go, and I'll go, da da pa pa pa, da 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 da, and the musicians will go, no no, I'll, that's what we're playing. So like our default is different, our, our right. way of playing, the attacking, the how I how I approach the notes, how I do the falls, how I make it sound, how I make it all lock in so that the music, the brass has a has a has a has a function in our brain. Um, if you talk about the 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 the, the Parasha that we're, we're doing right now is parasha, what was Parashat Tetzaveh. Sure. was Parashat Tetzaveh. But the, the Kalei Mikdash, the part of the Kalei Mikdash, we had flutes, we had brass, right? Mm-hmm. We had percussion. There was an organ in the Beta Mikdash, right? And there was a, a, a guitar-style instrument or whatever. A, a harp? Or a... It, was a lute, it was a lute. Okay. A, a, you know, the, the lyre, right? So basically, our, our current... Our current band that we play at weddings is the same band, just louder, but it's the <laughs> same thing in a choir, right? right? So if you look at the Shira choir or the, any of the other choirs, right, or the Yedidim choir, right. right? So it's the same concept. You have a choir, brass, flutes. The, it's nothing changed in 4,000 years of human history. It's just, the, just the drums and bass. <laughs> it's the same drums. Okay, I guess the yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah, I hear that. And the bass, they probably had a probably ginormous had one. Bass, they probably yeah. had some kind of a big box with a <laughs> string, right? <laughs> what, the one string bass. <laughs> the one string, whatever, they had something, right? Yeah. A bala like, ever see the big yeah. triangle? <laughs> so so the, the horn, the brass sound of, of, is, is ingrained in our thing. There's going to be a war. Pa-pam, pa-pam. Sure. You have to play it that way. You have to bring it. When you're playing a dance song, when the horns pop in, people get up. Yeah, and you can hear a song without the horns. Take out the horns. A great song. Unmute the mute the horns. Right, it's like an excitement and energy that that like. Right, just unmute the horns, and suddenly <laughs> it's a different song. Now there's a party. I think that's why we you know what I mentioned before. Like, you you know your energy, which comes across in a visual way, is so important because otherwise you kind of have this dissonance. Like you've got like you know three guys there playing like these great lines, but then looking like. Like, not like they don't believe them, but like they're not, you know. I, yeah, they're I falling asleep. They're trying I, to look professional. I actually, I actually, um, I was in London about five years ago, and I saw Bruno Mars um, in the O2 Arena, and I was very close to the front, and it was an unbelievable show. But I think that was what struck me the most. He had a, fi- I think, five-piece horn section, who were all wireless, and like, as well as playing, didn't stop dancing and like having the best time. And I was like, wow, like what a what a feeling, what an energy. Mm-hmm. Um, I also wanted to just say quickly that hearing you talk about um, Mona and all that stuff, like to me, it's kind of, um, it's like why I'm, one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is that so many people who for years have um, consumed Jewish music, and I'm not talking about musicians who obviously know you, and, and but like you are such a huge part of making that sound, but without like someone breaking it down and being like, okay, what's behind this? CD or Spotify or MP3, it's like who are the people behind all the other stuff? So I, I think it's really cool, and you're probably going to tell me to cut that out, but I'm not going to because I I think it's uh it's amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we can go back to your story, where 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 were we up to with that? We're up. So you're to, in New York. You're busy. So you're now, in, in so now I, I I came back to playing 
<clears throat> a lot of weddings and a lot of events and I'm really enjoying it. So it, it became a thing. So now I'm just like enjoying every day. I work I work with amazing people. I mean, over my, my career, I played with like a lot more Laufer, a lot of Laufer albums. I toured with Daddy. I love a show. Can we talk long. about that? How, I, w I would love to know what that, that was like. Daddy, like what was Daddy was the, there's this video on YouTube somewhere where it's like, please get off the stage, please get off the stage, where they shut down the show and throw people off the stage. Um, and and that's what working with Daddy was. <laughs> Daddy was the most insane, like when he got the crowd riled up, and I was part of it, right? So, right. so it was basically a piano, me, and if I would bring in a couple of uh, you playing trombone or trumpet, Trumb trombone, okay, so it's just piano, trombone, and drums. That was it. That was wow. the, that was we we toured like when we did this That's a lot. That's great. Yeah, it was great. It was like piano, trombone, ground. People people don't appreciate trombone. People, you know, but but it's it's a great instrument. It's like wonky and it's it's, sure. a, it's a party. It's pretty good. And, and, yeah, we would get the party rolling and uh, like like once the party rolling, it's like you had to like. Ooh. How long did you were you touring with him? Like five years. What? This was in Israel. This was in Israel. Yeah, and then and then and then. <laughs> Then I had kids, little kids, and then it was like it was hard, and I was, I was, right. I was trying to like settle down and find something a little bit easier to to maintain a crazy lifestyle, party yeah. lifestyle. Um, I, I was thinking actually on, on the way here how um, you're you're like really like a a staple in the Hasidic world here as well. Like I feel like a lot of your gigs, right, are, are in the yeah in that kind of world. Um, it's it's pretty awesome that like I don't know I I think like when I compare it to Israel how everything's kind of divided or you know also here is divided R really yeah I feel, I feel the Hasidic like music is not is not at all the regular music okay it's, saying they have their, their they own. have their own tunes and each it's it's a completely different way of playing it right it's a different vibe so how did you get into that world into the Hasidic world. Like when I say, sorry, when I say Hasidic, because some people call Jewish music Hasidic pop music, so but I'm saying like first, the Williamsburg. Uh, so my first, well, the Williamsburg, through Avrumi Burko in, in America, okay. because I started working with Avrumi Burko. Sure. Also a great producer, does a lot of amazing stuff. Him and Aftuli Schnitzler. Sure. So Aftuli Schnitzler, I read in the Mishpucha magazine, interesting story about him, is that he, he wrote, that's, that's his story, it's not my story. Because he contacted me once, he wanted to do a session for a song, and he wanted to learn how to do how to do a recording session. Wow. So he came down to West Hempstead to Eitan Cantor's uh, studio, and I showed him how you're supposed to produce and how you sit in the studio and everything. Wow. And apparently, that's that's what like kickstarted. That's he started. Uh, he wrote Mishpacha. He actually mentions my name there. So I was like, oh wow, I didn't know I had that's that kind of influence. Huge. Yeah. Because now he's one of the biggest producers. So I have that sure. kind of influence on people. It's good. It's good. Wow, that's awesome. I like. I like. One of the things I like working with producers is telling them what they should do right with the brass. Tell them you don't have to hire me, but you have to know how to write for for, sure. how to write it or what to do correctly, so that your horns come out right. I feel like also like a a good producer should be should be open to hearing that about any instrument. It's like at the end of the day, most of the time you're working with people who have spent their entire life just working on that instrument. And obviously you're bringing together all the different sounds, but if a bass player or a drummer or a trumpet player says, by the way, I can help you get the best out of this, or like, you know, why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you? So that kind of makes sense. Um, here's, a, here's a question for you, because we're talking a lot about Jewish music. What is Jewish music to you? Ooh, that's a very big question. I'll tell you why. Because somebody <laughs> told me I was I was in Utah. I'm touring now with Benny Friedman. Okay. Uh, some writer. I like. I'm in the intermission between this. Oh, uh, this is the, like even. Yeah, we're like in between. We have one cool. in Boston this week, and and um. And this girl that was uh, the, in Utah in, in Salt Lake City was saying, I only listen to Jewish music. I only listen to Jewish music. And I was like, is there such a thing as a Jewish music? And I, I th thought about it. And I, and I told her, I think the only Jewish thing about Jewish music is the lyrics. Okay, interesting. It's the lyrics. There is a Jewish flavor. So, for example, 
um, when you take, when you marry like the non-Jewish music with the Jewish music, you get a unique sound that is Jewish, but you have to because bring- Because of the lyrics? Because of the lyrics and because of the tempos. They, they take the tempos and they do things with it that are, are not standard. So basically they, you change the tempo. So there is something Jewish. But do you not think, what about like intention or, or like, you know, if someone just takes a, a pasuk and puts it to- I'll give you an example. My teacher, my trombone teacher, right from this. So his name was Stuart Taylor and he went to Poland for a tour with the Israel Philharmonic and he came back and he told me, I went to the museum in whatever okay. and there was a picture on the wall and it said, drinking song from 17th century. Like there's a, oh, a, a one of the first no one of the first uh, one of the first written music. It's a Polish song. Okay. And he's reading the Polish song and it goes la 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 na 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 na. na. I'm like, ask me about Jewish music, right? Right. There's also there's a Chabad nigan also, which I don't know if it na 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 na. One of those which was a Russian folk song about let's go to the to the to the pub and drink vodka. Right, well, all Chabad <laughs> songs are drinking songs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, By the way, I have this amazing Chabad project with, with the, that, that's coming out with, uh, with Moshe Laufer, I think uh, it's coming out this week, I think. This week? I think this week, or I don't know, it's, uh, it's coming out soon, so, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, it's funny, because, uh, you know, people, people talk about, like, you know, Jewish music, and, and it's, I, I'm really enjoying, like, the, the different people I ask this question to have completely different answers. Um, and most recently, someone asked, she said to me, I think that really people's response to what is Jewish music normally kind of says most about their interaction with, you know, either how, how they, their interaction with music or how they grew up um, or something like that. I mean, Yossi Green told me there's no such thing. There isn't Jewish music. He said there's... Um, there is a Jewish song. Um, but, you know, you mentioned the lyrics, but like, what about a, a tune that has no lyrics? You know, you have guys like Zusha who, who when they, people first started listening to them, it was really just like, they had this cool kind of indie underground vibe, singing these simple songs of just, you know, na na na, la la la. But there was something that felt I mean, Jewish uh, about it. I mean, Karl Bach invented that. Yeah. I played with Carl uh, Bach. <laughs> hold up. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Green. Wait, like, no, no, stop, oh, stop. stop. Oh, that, oh, where, oh, when and how? You bring up a lot of names. All these guys are like friends, you know. But, okay, well, we're gonna. Have, we're, we may have to do a part two here. Tell me about. <laughs> tell me about Carl Bach. Nothing. I happened to work with Daddy, <laughs> and we had a sh couple of shows, and one of the shows was Carl Bach. Did so. you interact with him? Yeah. Yeah. And? He was a very, very interesting guy. He was very deep. Right. Very deep guy, but he was a guy. I mean, was, I mean, at this point in my career, it sounds very self-centered, but basically I show up in a place and everybody's just, <laughs> everybody just, it's just different other people, right? right? You know what I mean? It's like, oh, now there's these people around me. Right. Interesting. Like, I oh. still have the same horn and I still need to play. Right, I'm holding a trombone. Let's see who the people are going to show up yeah. today. It's, oh, wow. Yeah, well, I guess it makes sense once you played with Shlomo Kohlbach and Jay-Z and Elton John. And, you know. It's it's like I get, it's it's really for my basketball, right? LeBron James is the star. Oh, okay. Right? LeBron James is the star. But he's surrounded by all these guys, let's say, on the, on the bench, right? I'm one of the bench guys. I get up once in a game. I'll shoot a three, then sit down, right? Then maybe once every five games, you know, there'll be a highlight, or 20 games, right. there'll be a highlight on. But really, it's ever, about LeBron do, James, right? Not do you, me. Do you ever, like, feel that, the, like, do you ever not, do you ever want to be a not bench guy in some form of way, or? I'm pretty happy with my role because, I'll tell you why. If you're an artist, let's say you came up with this great song, now you have to sing that same song for the next 40 years. Oh, we want that song. Okay, now I'm going to sing yeah. a song. I get the, I get, yeah, one day I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah. One day I'm going to be in Madison Square Garden with some, some sure. famous guy. The other guy, next day I'm going to be wedding, beautiful wedding. People are getting married. There's food, you know? It's yeah. Like, no, yeah, that is Carnegie Hall. I don't know, whatever. It's there's, like, there's excitement and variation. Yeah. Yeah, well, totally. I heard yeah, that. I'm just, I'm just experiencing life. Well, you know, Madison Square Garden, you, you played with Yishai, right? Yeah. In a few months ago. How was that? I, feel like I got great seats for a great show. 
<laughs> that must have been a pretty unique experience, though. I mean, like, I know I've you've done a lot big, of shows. I've played right. bigger shows. I've... It wasn't about bigger, though. It was about... Oh, first time in America, this kind Just of Just for thing. that amount of Jews under one roof, uh, singing... It was very exciting. I'll tell you what was it was it was really really unique, but uh, um, uh, um, but it was really neat, nice to see the power of so many so, so many people to so many people come out and, and right. being part of a you see because you never get to see these people you hear about them you see on social media somebody comments but suddenly you see it it's like we went with Benny Friedman last week I, I was I'm, I'm we're touring and and you go to and he decided to go to communities that don't ever have any shows nice. Salt Lake City. Right. Atlanta, I don't know, like you know what I mean, like Dallas, like Houston. Out. In Houston, they told us that that um, that they never had a show like this kind of big, right. this big show. Um, right, these communities, and you see, and suddenly the people come out and and in force, and you see a lot of. So yeah, definitely Madison Square Garden. There's when when you see people coming out to, for a statement, it's definitely. Sure. I feel special. I feel like I'm bigger. I'm. I have an actual mission in life. I'm not just like, here I am just having fun. I'm having fun and I have a mission in life. Mission, right. 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 Um, what's What's coming up for you? Anything exciting? Anything? You in the world? I'm doing Deer Shoe in Argentina next week. For people who don't know what Deer Shoe is. I What's don't know what Deer Shoe is. <laughs> it's Deer Shoe. I just Deer. show up and sit on the I bench. Just, I just sit up with a trombone and find out. Is it not? It's a, it's yeah, a kind yeah. of big CM, right? Yeah, it's a CM. Chef. Uh, Argentina? Argentina and Mexico. Wow, so it's like the South American. South American thing. chapter. Wow. The one here is like huge, like a lot of people, right? Yeah, we did one in, uh, but that wasn't Deer Shoe. It was just a CM of uh Oh, you did the one in MetLife? Yeah. Wow. How was that? Cold. <laughs> as, could you like ever have imagined as a as a little kid in Rakhova that you were going to play in the, at the CMA Shas in MetLife? I'll tell you a story. Let's go. A good story. So when I was thirteen, Rav Simcha Cohen Cook. Anybody know you know who he is? Yeah. So Simcha Cohen Cook uh, was the rabbi of my shul. He was a little rabbi. Nothing. It wasn't. I mean, he was important, but he wasn't as important as now. I'm talking about like sure. many many yeah. years ago. And so it was my bar mitzvah, and I said, I'm studying trombone, and I, I'm, what I dreamed was, because I was playing an orchestra, I want to make music. So he goes, I bless you, I bless you that you'll make music, and it'll be Jewish music. Wow. Yeah, and that's basically been my path. That's huge. And it's crazy. It's a crazy story, because really I never, is. when I was a kid, and I, and I resented it. I was like, no, just give me a, a bracha <laughs> to just make music. And he was like, no, I want you to make Jewish music. That's crazy. So it is pretty crazy that, that yeah, it's a true story. You've also done, uh, you do the Kinnas HaShluchim every year, right? I do the Kinnas HaShluchim every year. I cancel Everywhere. gigs. How, how are you, in, you, 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 is there ever like a night that you're not gigging? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I'll oh, see if we can find you something. Well, I'm recording. Oh, okay. I have all this recording. So this week, I decided not to take any gigs because I have to finish a million projects, like for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. <laughs> for everybody. There's a lot of really, really good, uh, talented young producers out there yeah. that are really transforming the Jewish music. I mean, the stuff that you're doing is 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 really unique, and, and I love I love what you do. So. No. Um, where do you see Jewish music headed? Because you've kind of been there since, at least for you know, Hasidic pop, popular music. You were there from the start. Well, the start it was it was Glesmer, and one of the things that because I liked like Phil Collins was huge, and all those oh. like Earth, Wind, and Fire, and we yeah. tried to bring that in. That was basically what Mona. Life. That's what Mona and Laufer. Laufer was more Hamish, right? But that's what Mona brought. Mona and Laufer, and for most part, that's what they brought to the table. Was trying to bring the modern pop horn sound into Jewish music. So. And then it just got stuck forever at <laughs> the horns. But well, because we've moved away from it a little bit. Yeah, but but the pop horns is where it's at. It's yeah. not, you don't really hear klezmer horns oh, anymore. Right, for sure. Like you'll hear it on a couple of songs, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Right, the other thing that we have to say is that I don't do klezmer. I don't do, the horns that I do is not klezmer. But you can, I mean, it's you pop. could. I could, but it's not, it's, it's pop. Right. It's pop horns. It's a different, yeah. Right. I see Jewish music just going forward, just a lot of great talent and onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards. All right. Danny, thank you. 
that was really fun. Um, I feel like I could probably hear like hours more of uh, stories, but we should uh, probably wrap it here and um, maybe we'll do a part two. Who knows? Yeah. Anything else you want to add before we sign out? Yeah. Th- first of all, thanks for having me. Of course. I'm so happy we did this. It's, um, first of all, a lot of success with your, with your, um, with your new, with your, your endeavor, this Thank blog, you. and I hope it, it, it succeeds. What, so else, what, what else would I want to say? What else would I want to say? Should we play a song? Thank you.